Well, good morning again, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, thank you especially to uh, all the people who make the, the music and the worship here possible. Um, I think this morning when we sang uh, Abide With Me, that was, I don't know, it, maybe it was just a personal thing, but I, this room I feel like has never felt so full. I think everyone was actually singing that song. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that the projectors went out and we were all uh, <laughs> paying a little bit more attention, but that was um, really wonderful. So abide with me. That's that's our that's our theme, our topic for this morning, as uh, as you can tell from our gospel reading. And I wonder this morning if there are any people out here. Certainly, there are of uh, uh, farmers and gardeners and green thumbs and people who like to be out with trees and plants and things like that. I'll say for myself, certainly, uh, I I'm not I'm not that person. Uh, growing up. I was fortunate enough to never have to do yard work um, because of pretty bad uh, pollen allergies, right? So uh, my dad would send me out to pull weeds and I would just come back with my eyes swollen shut and red and sneezing uncontrollably and things like that. So mowing the lawn, things like that, unfortunately, uh, I, I was able to get out of those things, which I despised doing anyways. Uh, for um, hopefully a good reason. But in this morning's gospel reading, we see that uh, Jesus is once again using the world of agriculture to tell us something about the spiritual world, to use it as an illustration. And think of all of Jesus' parables and how often he's talking about the farmers and crops and seeds and fields. And today's parable is no different. In fact, it reminds me a lot, this passage that we just read, of uh, the parable of the sower. And I'll, I'll explain a bit of why I think there's some parallel here. Because, see, in the parable of the sower, we have the one who sows uh, the seed, the father, the one who scatters the seed on the earth, and Christ himself, the word of God, is the seed that is sent to the earth in order to bring forth the harvest of righteousness. And we are the different types of soil. And of course, the goal of the soil is to produce a harvest, to produce fruit. So the different types of soil, therefore, are the different obstacles that we might face in producing fruit. So Jesus lists first uh, the pavement, the hard pavement uh, that prevents the word from penetrating our hearts. He talks about being hardened by unbelief. And the seed that falls on rocky ground and withers in the sun, well, that's the person who is discouraged by troubles. And the seed that falls among the thorns is the person who is distracted by wealth. So if we avoid these dangers, we will be the healthy soil, the good soil that bears fruit 30, 60, even 100 times as much. But now... In John chapter 15, Jesus says that the Father is a vine dresser. Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. And just as soil without seed will never produce anything, so branches without the vine can bear no fruit, as uh, Anthony's wonderful children's story this morning illustrated. And so here's where the parable of the vine simplifies things. Because rather than focusing on those obstacles which may prevent us from bearing fruit, Jesus boils it down to something very simple. He gives us this sequential three-step process. One, if we abide in Christ, then we will bear fruit, or rather, he will bear fruit in us. And if he bears fruit in us, then he says, the Father will prune our hearts. But notice, even among those three things, that our sole responsibility is to abide. Rather than warning us against unbelief or discouragement or distraction, Christ boils it down to one condition. There's one thing you need to make sure you do in order to bear fruit. One condition to being a mature and healthy Christian. One thing that God expects and requires of you. You abide in me. 
Remain in me. Hold on to me. Don't let go. And when you're weak, turn back to me. May you seek to be closer to me every day than you were the day before. Let me be the water that you drink, Jesus says, because I am the water of life. Let me be the bread that you eat, because I am the bread of life. Let me be the first and last and everything in your life, because I am the Alpha and the Omega. Abide in me. See, this is the great mystery of the gospel, that we are in Christ. Now, this is language that Paul uses again and again and again. And perhaps we've heard it so many times that we've lost the sense of its strangeness. After all, what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, this wonderful and mystical union of Christ and the church, from Paul's point of view, is initiated at baptism. Listen to what Paul says. He tells the Galatians, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And to the Romans, he even clarifies. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, then surely we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. See, I refuse to believe that baptism is just an external show. It's more than just an interesting symbol when a person is baptized, they are baptized into Christ. They are a branch grafted onto the true vine. And in the waters of baptism, we are buried with Christ. We are crucified with Christ. We fulfill the call of Jesus to take up your cross and follow me. And so through baptism, we are united with Christ in his death. And if we are so united to him in his death, then we will also be joined with him in his resurrection. But the call of the gospel this morning is more than simply to be in Christ, but to abide in him, to remain in him, and so bear much fruit. And so we must persevere in this baptismal grace, because as much as we might not like it, even after our baptism, the old self continues to reemerge. We fall back into old ways. And so we must constantly be returning to Christ. Repentance must for us be a daily routine. Like a branch that draws life from the vine, we must draw nourishment from the life of prayer. We can never allow ourselves to be separated. Otherwise, Without it, we wither up and die. We fall off and are thrown out. Prayer needs to be the very air that we breathe. Our minds should constantly be wandering back into prayer as if out of habit. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And I think maybe sometimes we hear that and we might be tempted to think that if we're to pray without ceasing, then it means that, well, I don't necessarily need to carve out a special time for prayer because I'm always praying, right? In the car, as I'm falling asleep, prayer is just kind of a mode that I exist in. But see, carving out time for prayer is precisely what allows us to develop the habit to have a meaningful and effective prayer life throughout the day. We should strive, I believe, to spend a thoughtful hour each day in deliberate, uninterrupted prayer. And now my suspicion is that that sounds to many of you radical, if not impossible. 
what could I possibly have to say to God for an hour? Two or three minutes at tops to say everything that I need and to thank him for everything that I have. What could I possibly do for an hour? But that precisely is the problem, you see. Unfortunately, many of us have come under the impression that praying simply means telling God what you want and thanking him for what you have. And that is one kind of prayer, but it's by no means the only kind of prayer. It's one mode of praying, but prayer is so much more than this. Prayer at its very core means this. Let me give you this simple definition of what is prayer. Prayer is the raising of the heart and the mind to God. So singing is prayer. Listening to sacred music is prayer. Reading scripture, especially the Psalms, is itself a form of praying. Prayer should engage the imagination. Prayer should engage all of our senses. Prayer is not just about speaking, but about reflecting. Every night we should spend time prayerfully reviewing our day, thinking about where God has led us and what God has taught us. And each morning we should prayerfully be anticipating the day and preparing ourselves for what God may have in store. Prayer doesn't just take one single form. And perhaps if we realize this, it might be easier to spend more time in prayer, and I hope so. Because it's this kind of prayer, this basking in the light of God's presence, drawing nourishment from God's life, it's through this kind of prayer that we abide in Christ. If this is what it means to abide in Christ, then what follows is that we will bear good fruit. Through this life of grace and prayer, Christ now lives in us and through us bears fruit. Jesus says, those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. For if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, then it's not us who bears the fruit but Christ at work within us. Again, listen to the words of Paul to the Philippians. He says, It is God who is at work within you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, it is God at work within you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That means even your desire to please God is itself God at work within you, let alone the capacity to actually accomplish anything. God is at work within us. And then Paul adds, it is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ. So God will be at work within us if only we hold fast to the word of life, that is to Christ himself. Christ will bear fruit in our lives if only we abide in him. And what's the, what's the purpose of fruit? Think about this for a moment. In the natural world, fruit, apples and peaches and whatever, what's the purpose of fruit? Imagine, for instance, a healthy tree in the natural world bearing good fruit. The fruit is eye-catching. It's color. It's sheen. That's why fruit is always, it, it looks appealing because it's meant to catch the eye. Because fruit wants to be eaten. The fruit wants to be eaten and so some animal will come along and pick the fruit and eat it. But you see, now the seeds of that fruit perhaps even passing through the body of the animal, will be taken somewhere else. And now a new tree emerges. So you see that natural and biological function of fruit is this twofold. First, it is to provide nourishment for those around us. And so by giving itself for the life of the world, it is able to reproduce itself and new trees are born. 
And this twofold function of fruit in the natural world is the same as the purpose of fruit in the spiritual world. What does it mean that we are fruit bearing believers, but that we, like Christ, give ourselves for the life of the world? Through our works of love, our works of mercy, our works of justice, we provide nourishment to the world. So the first and most immediate effect of this life of prayer and spiritual growth is that we learn to meet the needs of the world around us. And in doing so, the church grows. New trees begin to sprout as a result of our bearing fruit. So by spiritual fruit, what do we mean? But those works of love, those works of service that inspire others to have faith. The most essential tool in evangelization is good works. Works of love done for their own sake. And so Jesus says, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Finally, then Jesus says, every branch that bears fruit, the father prunes to make it bear more fruit. Pruning, you see, involves cutting, breaking, loss. Pruning from the perspective of a plant can be understood as a painful experience. But ultimately what it does is for the good of the plant itself. And even last night as I was thinking about this, I, I had to look up what exactly pruning does. I mean, I, I have some vague concept of, you know, cutting things away allows for more growth. But so I, I found this list of things that pruning accomplishes. And I was amazed by the kind of spiritual insight in these things. So first, pruning is the removal of dead, damaged, and diseased branches to help prevent insects and decay. Next, pruning works to thin out the leaves in order to increase air and sunlight. And finally, sometimes you get branches that overlap and they end up damaging each other. So, pruning in the spiritual life means what? But that the Father wants to cut out of your life those things that do more harm than good. The cutting away of dead and diseased branches is a call to repentance. But pruning doesn't just mean cutting off things that are bad or unhealthy. Sometimes, even if what we're busy doing isn't intrinsically bad, our life is just too cluttered. Our life is too busy. Our schedules are too full. And we don't have enough time for the spiritual life. And so we must cut back these overgrown leaves. That means a life of simplicity. And finally, pruning means resolving conflict between two branches. When we harbor feelings of resentment and jealousy and rivalry in our hearts, we crush the spiritual life at work within us. So in summary, then, we ask ourselves these three questions. Are you abiding in Christ? Do you daily renew the life given to you in baptism? And if you're not sure, then look to question number two. Are you bearing fruit? Is your life a gift to others? Does your love and service of others work as an effective and attractive witness to Christ? And again, if you're not sure, look to question number three. Are you being pruned? Are you allowing God to challenge and convict you and to show you those areas of your life where you need to change and grow? Are you, repair, are you prepared to let go of those things in your life that you love in order to cling more intently to Jesus Christ? In the end, that's what this all comes down to, that we cling to Jesus with every fiber of our being. We stay connected to him, trusting in him in all things and as we abide in him 
our lives will overflow in bearing fruit, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of righteousness, of obedience. So as we go from this place this morning, you can remember everything we've said by remembering just two words, trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So I invite you to stand with me now as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 590, 590, Trust and Obey.